So let's tie that into some terms in the news. So obviously OPEC um, you know, affects prices. The strength or weakness of the dollar affects prices. Actually, today the dollar is a little weak, so that's keeping prices somewhat stable at about $44. Um, but let's talk about some other things like rig count and storage. And it's interesting because they both affect prices and affect sentiment and are affected by prices. So as far as rig count, um, this is a chart of rig count by Basin, obviously, in the US. Uh, Baker Hughes uh, releases this data. So if you go to their homepage, you can see an update on the data. Um, it's viewed as a proxy for sector activity, so um, it can definitely affect sentiment. And as of the second, there were 407 crude rigs drilling. And if you want to compare that to 2014, in October 2014, we had 1,609 rigs drilling. Um, so that's an interesting data metric. We have 88 natural gas rigs and just 10 offshore rigs, which is kind of expected because offshore drilling is a lot more risky and a lot more expensive. Uh, in fact, a lot of banks kind of steer away, traditional lenders like us steer away from offshore drilling because it's so risky. Um, your company really has to know what they're doing with that capital. Um, Predictably, most of the rigs, you'll see the Permian, I believe it's that second bar right there. A lot of the rigs are operating in the Permian, so 207 of that 407 are operating in the Permian. Um, that's one of the most economic areas right now at this price level. So if you see M&A activity in the news, a lot of it is in the Permian or um, actually the scoop stack play in Oklahoma. I don't believe that's separately represented on this chart. Um, but look for those two plays to be kind of the hot areas right now. Uh, but I'll let you be the judge if it's overblown in some of the purchase prices. So let's take a look at storage of crude oil. That's something else that reports uh, frequently come out on. The EIA is the U.S. Energy Information Administration. Um, if you go to their website, there's a lot of data on prices. Um, it's very data heavy, but it's useful and very reliable data as well. Um, so storage capacity for crude oil has actually increased recently. Um, that's reported twice a year itself. Um, and that's, we're thankful for that because we've reached a high of 73% usage of our storage capacity given the downturn right now in the uh, supply outweighing demand. So that's primarily in Cushing, Oklahoma, and on the Gulf Coast is where our primary storage is. Um, internationally, some countries like Russia and China choose not to report their storage data. So that's interesting. Um, additionally, we some of the smaller countries, some of the other countries in OPEC, they do report their data, but it's not necessarily reliable. What, for example, Singapore, they don't report their data and they have one of the largest storage fields. So we don't know how much um, oil is sitting in their tankers. And it's actually been measured by the water depth. Um, people try to guess what that is. Scientists will try to guess what that is. But um, that's some, you know, that's oil could, that could flood the market as soon as prices rebound. So you don't know what's going to happen there. So it's an interesting kind of unknown. Um, one thing as I was you know, kind of doing my research, we have 695 million barrels in the US strategic oil storage reserve. And I was surprised to find out that would only last us about 36 days. So <laughs> maybe kind of a scary metric if we go to, go to war or something, I hope not. Natural gas storage on the other hand is very cyclical, especially due to its tie-in um, with heating season. So April through October is injection season into storage. Obviously you can see the metrics up here. The most interesting thing about natural gas storage is you kind of ask how do they store it since it's a gas. So it'll be the main way they store it is depleted oil and gas fields um, because there will be a, a cap on there, a natural cap to hold the gas in. Uh, the other ways are depleted aquifers that have impermeable cap rock. And lastly, uh, salt cavern formations, which that's primarily on the Gulf Coast. And that kind of ties into liquefied natural gas because that's easier to store when it's cold 
to extreme temperatures. So it's converted to a liquid form, which actually, it's actually a vapor form. Um, it's a more feasible way to transfer gas long distances since we've been historically been bound by pipelines. Um, and that's why so much of our gas is domestically delivered and used here. Um, the US, I think Reed, Reed mentioned this, we are heavily switching from importing LNG to exporting LNG. And this actually takes a lot of time because of the expense of, um, of building the LNG terminal. So for example, um, Chenier is building a Corpus Christi LNG terminal and the estimated cost is 10 to 12 billion. And that's a many year project, so it's a huge investment. So um, these 12 terminals I mentioned are actually import terminals. And there are 10 terminals that have been approved um, by the regulatory body called FERC that are being constructed right now. But um, that's a heavy project. So it's not more wide, widespread yet as far as exports because it takes so much time to build those terminals and so much capital investment. Um, something else to note, though, in looking up some notes from a research firm is that with the construction that's in place, we're actually kind of maxed out on LNG. That's not gonna be a, globally at least, that's not gonna be a huge solution to propping up natural gas prices. Um, and that balance where demand will outweigh supply probably won't happen until 2023, 2024. So don't look for a huge spike in natural gas prices, at least in my personal opinion. Okay, and the last uh, controversial topic, um, fracking. I don't know if any of you felt the earthquake on Saturday, I didn't myself, but um, <laughs> it's kind of relevant for today. So this is a, kind of a picture of a horizontal well and a representation of fracking. And I'm sure many of you know that they flush at high pressure water and propent that's in that water that's usually sand, but sometimes ceramics and, um, many companies are kind of tinker with their own special recipe for that particular rock for what's best. So they, they do it in stages. So only one stage in that horizontal part of the well will be fracked under high pressure, break up the rock, and then they'll move on to the next stage. Um, it's been around for 60 years, but it, as you probably know, it became more economically viable in the 2008 timeframe and really widely applied to all of the shale plays. So there are obviously several concerns related to fracking. Um, one of them is the earthquake concern. And um, part of that has to do with the saltwater disposal wells that get um, the flowback fluid from fracking and uh, fluid that comes out of the well in general as a byproduct are flushed in these saltwater disposal wells. And it's thought that that can help uh, generate earthquake activity, especially in Oklahoma. And there are opinions on both sides. I don't have a definitive opinion on whether, you know, what's going on there. You see the Oklahoma Geological Survey, who's very concerned about it, and then people on our industry side who are not. So you kind of be the judge of that. Regardless, it will be a big economic cost to Oklahoma. Um, so that's just something to think about. The industry uh, is so prevalent there. So we have cost to research that and to manage the risk there. A couple of other risks, um, especially re related to water, people worry about aquifer pollution. Um, you'll interestingly note that most aquifers are about 500 feet below the surface, and this well is drilled 6,000 to 10,000 feet below the surface and encased in several layers of pipe. So, um, you know, in general, we should be we should be safe there. It's highly regulated. Uh, so you can, you can be the judge, everyone has their opinion, but um, if you go out to a well site, there are a lot of, in addition, the water coming out of the well, there are a lot of regulations to make sure that's protected, protecting the land. So big, big issue in our industry and um, big issue for us to make sure our customers are doing the right things environmentally, because we don't want that liability. So um, now I'm going to pass it off to Reed to talk a little bit more about um, how we lend in our space and what we do here at the bank. 